Uh, I'm just going to mute, mute everybody for now. And if you have to make a comment, just unmute and then mute yourselves again. All right. So the, we are Heal Lifestyle Academy. And you see the initials, what it stands for, health and wellness. E for, excuse me, effective communication. The A for anger resolution. The L for leadership and personal development. So the health and wellness encapsulates um, physical health, uh, psychological health, um, spiritual health, mental health, right? All those uh, we cover in health and wellness. And of course, as we normally let you know, there are two things and two promises. I'd like to make the two things. Thing number one, uh, get a writing instrument and paper and take notes. Take notes. Why? Because the shortest pencil is longer than the longest memory. Uh, the second thing is to stay away from the five worst words in the world. And those words are, I have heard that before. That creates closed mindedness and we can't learn with that mindset. The two promises that I make to you is that you will definitely learn something today that you can use right away, right away. Uh, promise number two, I'm available to work with you further. At the end of the presentation, you would see our contact information. Let's go through our, our disclaimer. The information provided in this presentation is intended for general informational purposes only and should not be considered as a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. As a naturopathic doctor, I am sharing insights and suggestions based on my expertise in natural health and wellness. However, it's important to consult with a medical doctor before making any significant changes to your health regimen, especially if you have underlying medical conditions or taking medications who have specific health concerns. So we have started a um, journey of uh, 24 meds or medicines that you will not find in a pharmacy, 24 medicines that you will not find in a pharmacy. All right, and that's our series. And basically we are exploring various aspects that can be considered as medicine without the use of pharmaceuticals. And these non-pharmaceutical methods play a vital role in maintaining and improving our health and our well-being. And we have been using as our definition of medicine that it is something that affects your well-being. It could be a positive effect or a negative effect. Medicine is something that affects uh, your well-being. And so uh, we have covered 13 weeks, and today we are in week number 14, number 14, non-pharmaceutical medicines, number 14. And today we want to present to you on the topic that loving is medicine. I'm, I'm not sure if you have ever thought about love and what it means, but we're telling you that loving is medicine. And we want to find out how love nourishes our mind, our body, and our life, right? That's our goal uh, today. So first of all, you may be asking, what is love or what is loving, right? So love is a strong feeling of care and closeness that can be described in many ways. So let me ask, what are some ways you think that love can be described? Repeat the question again, please. What are some ways that you believe that love or loving can be described? Let's give me one or two ways that you, you, you can describe. Caring. Okay. Emotion. Emotion. All right. So there are more people online. You can help us. How would you describe love or loving? More words and actions. Words? Is it more words and actions? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. So let's go through. Can you so, hear me, Pastor Rayborn? I can hear you now. Okay. Uh, I'd like to give a response to that question. Sure. And that is uh, based on principle. Okay. Uh, principles that are 
evidenced and witnessed as a result of the way a person lives, how they mm -hmm. uh, conduct themselves, how they respect others, how they even love themselves. Because okay. uh, sometimes emotions can get, can be a blinder mm -hmm. if you're not observant of how a person has integrity and live by integrity. Okay. So it is a, I would think that it's a combination. Okay. Okay. One not separate from the other. Okay. Good. Good. All right. So let's look at some of, of the uh, ways that I will describe love. Affection. Yeah. Love is affection, right? Love is connection. Uh, when you love somebody, you want to connect with them. Uh, security. Love provides security. Uh, it's nurturing. It's unconditional. And you see that especially in a mother's love. Doesn't matter what the child has done, they can have burned down a factory with 100 workers. They love their child, no matter what, right? Uh, kinship or personal ties. And also you have sexual desire, that's a part of a part of love, uh, admiration, benevolence, or common interests. All right. So, so these are just some other ways uh, that uh, love can be described. Affection, connection, security, nurturing, unconditional, kinship or personal ties, uh, sexual desire, admiration, benevolence, or common interests. All right. So um, uh, Auntie Lynn and, and our family, we have a kinship. We have personal ties. All right. Sister mm -hmm. Irina, you know, I used to be her pastor. So we have we have we have personal ties. Right. Uh -huh. um, uh, we have affection. We have connection. I've been to her home. Lynn has been to our home. All right. So different ways to describe love. All right. Oops. Yeah. I th that wrong, wrong name there. All right. So we, in John 3, 16, it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Tell me, where do you see connection or any of the words here? Affection, connection, security, nurturing, unconditional, personal, kinship, admiration, benevolence, common interest in this verse. Do you see any, any of those there? I'd say kingship. Uh, he loved the world. So the love that he created. Okay. Is the he king. gave. Okay, he gave. Okay, so yeah. which one is that? He gave. He gave. He gave. Um, that's affection. The... Huh? Affection. Affection, okay. Yeah. I see all of the above. Yeah. And when it comes to the sexual desire, that was created uh, in the Garden of Eden. Between Adam and Eve. Okay. You know. Mm -hmm. So it's it's all of those those attributes, okay. those qualities. Okay. Yeah, for some reason I'm not sure what's going on with my slides, but you notice the title says self confidence. Uh -huh. and it should be loving. I'm not sure what happened. I, I put loving. I'm not sure what happened, but so you you, you know what it is, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. So why why is loving considered to be medicine? Why is loving considered to be medicine? Love is considered medicine because it has the power to heal by fostering emotional well-being, reducing stress, and strengthening connections. Uh, so when we give and receive love, we experience feelings of happiness and security, which in turn have a positive effect on our physical and mental health. All right. So, but why is it important? Love is important for a lot of reasons, right? I will go through probably about six or seven of those. One, uh, because of mental and physical health. Healthy relationships are essential for mental and physical health. Love can help reduce anxiety and depression. And MRI scans show that people in stable relationships have less activity in the brain's anxiety center. In fact, um, Dr. Dr. Leslie Ray Lapping Carr, um, psychologist at Northwestern Medicine uh, with expertise in sex and relationships, says the following. 
the mesolimbic limbic system in our brain is what relates to rewards and motivation. Rewards and motivation, right? So the more you are rewarded, is the more motivated you are to do the thing that keep that will reward you. So if you, uh, how, how what is the best way to put this? Well, first of all, let me ask you, what do you understand by this first sentence? Do you mind repeating that, um, that question, sir? Yeah, what do you understand by the first sentence? And somebody is writing on my screen. I wish you would not do that. Thank you so much. Yeah, the mesolimbic system in our brain is what relates to rewards and motivation. So in other words, we develop habits because we feel rewarded, we feel good, right? So the mesolimbic system in our brain rewards you right? That's the reward center of the brain. When you do something pleasurable, that's why you repeat the action. Right? Is that clear to everybody? Mm -hmm. Okay. So as you engage with things that bring you pleasure, the uh, there are neurotransmitters in your brain uh, that lead you to pursue that reward again and again. Right? Those people who are addicted to drugs, they, they, they felt some type of reward, right? The first time they took the drug and they want to get that high, that reward again. So they take a drug again. And after a while, it becomes automatic because they get become addicted, right? So there's a text, um, there's, if you can find a reference for me, um, it, it says something to the effect that, um, I think it's uh, 1 Corinthians, 10, 13. No, sorry, 10, 31, I believe. Yeah. Can somebody find it for me quickly? It is. First Corinthians 10, 10, 31. Anybody found it? I take the scale to my mind. Yeah. Nedez, are you there? All right. So it says, whether therefore you eat or drink, or oh. whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. So tell me how this text relates to what we just read here. Anybody? How do you see it relating? First Corinthians ten thirty one. How does it relate? By doing the right thing that is pleasing to God and not pleasing to man. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that's good. I, I, I want to go a little deeper in relation to what, what we read, read here in these two sentences. So the mesolimbic system in our brain is what relates to rewards and motivations, right? So the more you, you get a sense of reward from a certain action is the more motivated you are to doing it. So for example, if you said, hey, I want to lose uh, 25 pounds this year, and you start running or you start um, exercising, doing abs, what have you, and you begin to see the reward, you're losing the weight, your stomach is going down, you are more motivated to keep doing it. Yeah? Yes. Okay, okay so how can we relate this text in First uh, Corinthians 10, 31 to this? Or can we? Well, okay. Mm-hmm. Everything that we do not only just relates to eat or, or drink or gift. It says mm -hmm. whatever we do, we have mm -hmm. to do it for a purpose. And it can't be a selfish pur purpose. All of our doing, whether we're eating or drinking or whatever, it has. And since you went to the Bible, it has to have a spiritual basis. Right. And so why, why am I doing this? It's because I love the Lord. and My body is the temple of Christ. And so I want to please him. Okay. Right. And so with all of those rewards, knowing that Christ is a part of all of my experiences, that is going to deepen my uh, happiness. It's going to, uh, what uh, I was trying to think of this song. Anyway, yeah, it, it doing good stays with us. Mm -hmm. Practicing good habits stays with us. 
studying the word of God, it stays with us as long as we know why we're doing what we're doing and why we exist, why we exist, why we, okay. you know, it's, okay. it's all spiritually related. Okay. Thank you. In a Thank nutshell, you. in a nutshell, can we say do, do I say everything um, for the right reason? Okay. Yeah. And something so I will felt a phrase. <laughs> okay. I think it's again. So, so then another text again, John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. So how do we fit that text in it too, right? Because it says, as you are engaging with things that bring you pleasure, and Lynn mentioned the word pleasure, should we be seeking things that shows God that we love him, that brings him pleasure? And we, even though we don't feel the pleasure by faith, right? If you keep doing the thing, you will do the thing. Yeah. Yeah, we should do things that will please Christ. Correct. Okay. You Sister. know, because he says he's a jealous God when you go to uh uh Exodus 20. Mm -hmm. He said, I'm a jealous God, so don't have other idols. Don't don't seek things of the world. I am the only one that can bring you pleasure. Outside of me, you will mm -hmm. not you will not get that happiness, that permanent happiness. You will not experience the joy. Amen. I, I think I saw you on mute, uh, Sister Jocelyn. I think for the right thing. Do the right thing for the right thing. Yeah, hold, hold, hold on, Sister you, uh, Whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. And when you do all to the glory of God, and you see the rewards and the blessing you get from it, you keep doing it. Okay. Yeah. Amen. That's it, right? That's it. All right. Right. Okay. So I think we're in one accord. Okay. Yeah. Forming the habits of obedience. Yeah. So number two is sleep, right? Sleeping beside someone you love not cannot only help you relax, but sleep better as well. And this is a fight I have with my wife um, almost every night. I said, baby, sleep next to me in my back. I want to feel the warmth. But she loves to roll. And I told her, I'm going to buy a smaller bed. I bet it's too big, the king size bed. And she's, <laughs> she's too far from me. I'm going to buy a single bed where she's got to sleep on her side right next to me. And once she moves, I miss that warmth, and I, I awake. I, it's hard to go back to sleep. And then I got to keep crawling over by her. So I think I, I'm going to buy a, a, some kind of rope to tie her up close to me so she can't, <laughs> right, Liv, so she can't move away. She can't yeah, move don't away. do that to my sister. Uh, oh, so that's your sister. I'm with your brother. See? Okay. Repent. Thank right. you, Liv. So sleeping besides someone you love can not only help you relax, but sleep better as well, All right? Number three, relationships. Love is the foundation or should be the foundation of relationships. And it's especially crucial in romantic unions. Both love and effective communication help to build trust, security, and romance between individuals. That's also true with with uh, your child. You're building mm -hmm. a love relationship with your child, so that's that should be a part of your answer there. Mm -hmm. But if you, it, yeah, okay, because I, I, if you would go back, you said romantic relationships. Well, yes, that's for adults. Mm -hmm. uh, both love and, and effective communication help. Yes, you're building trust with your children. You're mm -hmm. providing security for your children. And yes, the romance is platonic, mm -hmm. and right. with adults, it becomes personal. Mm -hmm. And notice it's not just communication, but effective communication, right? Where you mm -hmm. are not just talking at each other, but talking to, right, each other. All right, number four, a sense of belonging, right? When uh, your love, as well as your belonging needs are met it is likely that you may feel less alone and happier number five vulnerability vulnerability is important in relationships because it can help to foster closeness intimacy and trust all right so somebody tell me what this looks like vulnerability in a relationship how, how we can foster closeness, intimacy, and trust. For me, 
if I can be vulnerable with the, my significant other, that means he's allowing me. No, I'm, I'm going to I might be phrasing it wrong, but he's allowing mm -hmm. me to be who I am mm -hmm. and to feel what I feel. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I, I can't be what you expect me to be, but accept me as I am and allow me to cry when I want to cry. Mm -hmm. You know, allow me to share my thoughts. And I'm not necessarily asking you to tell me how to resolve. Just mm -hmm. let me uh, expel, you okay. know, and that's being vulnerable. Okay. Anybody else? You want to give it a shot? Everybody shy? Okay. And it, you know, yeah, I, I love the last part there where it says trust. Mm-hmm. But if you start criticizing me and always saying something negative when I am trying to be vulnerable to you, that you means that's back. not effective communication. Mm -hmm. You know, that that will, I will separate myself from you. Yeah. Well, you know, a lot of times, uh, whether it's, it's a close relationship or, or even like here on this platform where we're trying to build community, a lot of times people are afraid to talk, like like right now. People are just listening, they're like a sponge, because you know they don't want to be vulnerable. Maybe they have been hurt in the past, right? But if you want to build close relationships, if you want to foster closeness, intimacy, and trust, you have to be vulnerable, right? You got to start somewhere. Start small, all right? Okay, compassion. Uh, the feeling of connectedness that comes from love can motivate you to be compassionate and provide services mm -hmm. to others. All right. So why, why is love, why love is essential for holistic health? One, because we can say that love contributes to holistic health by addressing the well-being of the mind, the body, and the spirit. Emotionally, love promotes feelings of joy and it reduces anxiety. Physically, it can lower blood pressure and boost your immune system, right? That's why you can say, you know, when, when uh, you're in a love relationship and there's a breakdown, what do we normally want to eat? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Chocolate. Chocolate, what else? Chocolate. Ice cream, right? Because those things touch... Uh, our mesolimbic system, and we feel kind of comforted. Yeah. Right? And then we want more of it. We, yeah. we feel like a reward. We want more and more, right? Yeah. And so so that, that was happening there. So love is important, um, essential for holistic health emotionally, physically, and spiritually. Love encourages a sense of purpose and fulfillment, right? And we kind of covered it. You notice that each week we are kind of dovetailing on the previous presentation. Right, um, so it gives a sense of purpose and fulfillment that fosters a balanced, healthy overall life. Um, so let's go into how love affects our health. Uh, let's look at love effect on the brain. So love, or the feeling of love, releases feel-good chemicals like oxytocin. Now, this chemical right here, oxytocin can be a wonderful chemical. I touched on it last week, briefly, in the sense of um, they have done research on identical twins, especially babies. If one is very sick, they will place the, the, the well twin next to that uh, sick twin, and they will end up hugging each other, touching each other. And from the touch, that other twin who is sick normally gets better, right? Also in relationships, this is why it's kind of dangerous when you're just starting out uh, a relationship with somebody you're getting to know, you, you want to avoid touching. And I know some of us think we're growing. I, I've been married before, uh, or you know, I've had other relationships. I have two children. I, I can control myself. All of those lies we tell ourselves, right? Uh, oxytocin will knock you down and then you feel guilty afterwards, right? So if you really want to build up develop a, a good, um, solid, romantic relationship, walk slowly, build a friendship, and try not to get too touchy-feely too quickly because oxytocin will step in. And mm -hmm. what you feel as love 
is actually lust. Mm -hmm. All right. So, so we need to be very careful with the touching um, at the very um, at the onset. No matter how many times um, you think you know you have been in, in relationships, right? Uh, dopamine um, gives you motivation as well. Um, serotonin gives you that, that good feeling. All right. So, love releases uh, these feel good chemicals: oxytocin, dopamine, serotonin, and improves your mood and your emotional well being. It also reduces our stress, our stress hormone called cortisol, right? Yeah. Cortisol is important in terms of if you're facing danger, you're in a burning building, somebody trying to rob you, um, mm -hmm. your car's on fire, a dog is chasing you. Cortisol comes to, to develop stress to make your heart beat faster. Yeah, but normally you don't want cortisol in your system, right? It's a stress hormone and it aids in reducing anxiety and depression, right? Um, love's effect on the heart. So love, we said before, lowers your blood pressure. It improves your cardiovascular health and reduces the risk of heart disease. That's love, right? Emotional connections are linked to healthier heart rhythms and a lower likelihood of heart attacks. Right? All this is love on the brain and the heart. Mm -hmm. What about love's effect on the on our immune system? Right? So strong loving relationships boost uh, your immune system, making your body more resilient to illness and helping to speed up recovery. Uh, stress reduction and longevity. Love promotes relaxation and emotional stability, which leads to reduced stress levels, better sleep, and overall longevity. Uh, love is also a biblical mandate. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 14, the Bible says, let all things be done with charity. Charity. Charity is another word for love. Let all things be done with love. There's also a spiritual impact of love. Practicing love according to the biblical teachings promotes spiritual health and inner peace that strengthens your faith and strengthens your relationships. Uh, love is also seen as healing in scripture. Love is portrayed as a source of healing throughout the Bible, whether it's God's love for humanity or the love between individuals. So this highlights the importance of love in every aspect of our lives. And of course, there are different forms of healing love, right? We talk about initially romantic love, and this enhances emotional intimacy. It provides a sense of security and partnership, which contributes to mental and physical well-being. That's romantic love. Then you have familial love or family love. Uh, this supports personal growth. It provides emotional comfort and builds a sense of belonging and safety. We also have friendship. Friendship love, right? And this acts as a buffer against stress, loneliness, and it offers companionship and shared joy. Can we go back to the romantic love part? You know, uh, sometimes when there's a divorce or when there is death, particular, speaking particularly about the men, many of them get married soon after. Mm -hmm. What's going on with that? Is, do you think that they love the person or they're marrying the person because of loneliness or what have you? Well, I, I can only speak in a general sense because I don't know those men in particular. But I mean, general... a lot of men think, but I mean, but if you look at the bigger picture, for example, I know this uh, pastor mm -hmm. whose wife died and in six months he's getting married had a right to marry and they're still married today mm -hmm. 
but I'm wondering if it if it was based off of principal love rather than feeling lonely. The, you know, yeah, the emotional part, and yeah. and um, then the romantic part grew over time. But they they love each other. Yeah, you, you know, you you can you can look at couples and see that women it's easier for women to stay alone after a spouse has died or divorced, what have you, and then for a man. Right, um, men, men, men are babies basically. They need th that love, you know, and especially if they have been used to it, right? right? Or, or they, they're going to miss it. They're going to miss it, and they're going to look for it. They're going to look for it. Some women are very strong, you know. Like my husband died twenty five years ago. I'm not, I'm not getting married. I'm good, right? Mm -hmm. You would find men like that, you know. Men are, are built differently emotionally than than women are. All right, so self-love, right? So a lot of times we, <coughs> excuse me, we love other people, but we don't love ourselves. And how that shows up, that shows up in not forgiving yourself, right? So you might have gone to do a speech or to sing somewhere or, or, or you know, or whatever, and you mess up and you are hard on yourself, right? Or, or you have made some some boo-boo, some sin, so to speak. And you are hard on yourself. You would rather forgive other people than forgive yourself, right? Self-love is essential for self-care, self-compassion, and mental resilience. That's I, I, right, Warren. Yes. But, but if, you, if, you, if you don't love yourself, you can't honestly love another person. That's correct. That's correct. That's correct, right? So self-love helps in maintaining healthy boundaries, and reducing self-criticism. Uh, you, you cannot love yourself until you get to know yourself. A lot of us don't know ourselves, right? And that's why I, I invite people to do the DISC assessment, to get to see yourself in, in your communication with loved ones, get to understand why you do what you do. It, it's very important. A lot of us just grew up we know that certain things get us upset. We get mad, but we don't know why. Right. So we, so we don't love ourselves because we don't understand ourselves. And I've said before, um, I think I was doing a marriage series. Uh, the basis of of uh, marriage is not love. It is knowledge of the person and understanding of the person. You can't love somebody you don't know and don't understand. I think that has a lot of, I think that's has a more impact after you're married because before marriage, yes, you can get to know that person. And like I said, when I think when I first made my first uh, opinion about principle, mm -hmm. you have to look at that person's lifestyle and all of that and see if they're living by it. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I, I knew this couple who stayed together for 11 years. They finally got married, and in two years, they were divorced. What <laughs> happened to that? Well, okay. <laughs> a, a lot of things could have happened. Yes, Mary, go ahead. Um, but, Doc, sometimes um, you don't really know somebody because they could just put on a show for you, and then That's after right. you get married or you're all settled, That's you see right. the devil in its skin. Right, and and that's what I'm talk I'm talking about, right? That's why, um, a couple some about four slides ago, I talked about the neurotransmitters, and the, especially the one the oxytocin. Mm -hmm. A lot of times, we, we, if you look at television, and you look at the ad, you see a couple at the restaurant, probably their first date. The woman is indecently clad. She's showing off her her breasts for baby boys. The man is turned on. Then the camera um changes their home. Or in, at one of their homes or apartment building, whatever, you see a trail of clothing. You may, might see a glass of wine with lipstick on it. You see <laughs> some, yeah. some, some movement under the sheets, some rust, rustling. And then they come out to catch a breath. She, she takes the sheet wrapped around her and because of guilt. But the oxytocin stepped in and they, they, sometimes they don't even know the person's last name. They don't know the person where they work, with, who are the family members, if they're married, divorced. So we we rush into a physicality, and that makes us think we love the person when we strongly like them, 
I know a lot of lust to watch them. But like you rightly said, we haven't taken the time to build a friendship, to get to know this person without being alone with them, see them under different circumstances with their friends, with your friends, who can see what you cannot see. But we rush into relationship because we might be lonely, we feel desperate, all of our friends have somebody else, whatever the reason is. And we don't really know the person in, in four months' time, six months' time. You know, you make that big step towards marriage and you don't know this person. Mm -hmm. Right? And it's only, and you know, my mother taught me a saying since I was a child see me and come live with me are two different things. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Be because you, 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 chances are you haven't seen me brush my teeth. In fact, you don't even know if my teeth are stationary. <laughs> right? So, so you have to build a friendship and get to understand the person and be, say, well, yes, I could accept this. I can live with this. Or no, I can't. And if the person is being honest, you're both being honest with the friendship, you will see things. But mm -hmm. we rush into the romance. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, we're in love and we want to get married. And so, and then also, premarital coaching is very important. Um, if that person knows what they're doing, they can ask questions, they can bring out certain things so you can see before you make that dive. Right. And you mentioned earlier about an assessment. What was the name of that assessment? DISC, D I S C, DISC assessment. You, and you, 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 you offer that service? Yes, yes, I do. And there's a charge to it? Yes, there is so, a charge. What this man? But, I, but I'm your big sister. Yes, I, I'll give you a big sister um, prize. <laughs> business is business. <laughs> I give you. No, I, I have to charge because I, I have a, a third party company that um, does the assessment for me and sends, okay. me, sends me the results. And then I do a one hour coaching session with you over the assessment. So you get a 31 or 30 page um, assessment of who you are, why you are who you are. We give you, you a cheap, 30 pages, 30 pages, 30 pages you get. Um, and you get to understand why you do what you do uh, and how to relate to other people that have different uh, personality types. So it, it's wow. very compre comprehensive. Right, and the price, okay. the, the the price, the price is not bad. I charge one one ninety nine, and that includes the assessment, and it includes the one hour coaching. Okay, that's not bad. Yeah. All right. So we talk about self love. And is this assessment for a married couple or anybody can take it. It's for anybody. I I do it um, especially for couples who are um, getting premarital coaching for individuals. I do it at companies um, among their groups um, because it, it is a general assessment helps you to understand who you are, how to communicate better with your spouse, with your children, with your um, your other family members, your co-workers, mm -hmm. you name it, right? Okay. And and the assessment has different um, it has different levels. So, for example, somebody who is a student, mm -hmm. right? The assessment will have a different slant. Uh, somebody who is probably just left college and is trying to find out what job is good for them. You know, mm -hmm. That also has a different slant, depending on what, what the situa situation okay. is. Oh, All right? Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So we talk about self-love. Then we talk about agape love, right? This is the unconditional love. This is the love that God has for us, right? This is selfless. It's um, altruistic love. It encourages empathy. It encourages compassion. And it encourages care for others, fostering community well-being. So what is the role of love in mental well-being, right? So love can have a positive emotional impact because love creates feelings of happiness, feelings of security, and feelings of contentment, which are crucial for mental stability. There's also anxiety and depression relief. Close loving relationships reduce feelings of loneliness and provide support, which is critical in overcoming anxiety and depression. So, 
you know, um, for those people who celebrate Christmas, I I don't, but for those who do, it, that's one of the most lonely times that people who are single, people who are divorced, people who are elderly, living by themselves, that they go through. And there are a number of suicides that take place around Christmas time, right? Because it is seen as time for family and no one comes to visit you all year long. You're by yourself and the season comes and some people just can't take it anymore. And they're overcome with anxiety and depression, right? So in fact, just today, my family and I went to visit. I'm not trying to impress you, but to impress upon you, right? Um, one of our church members uh, who was turned 95 years old last Friday. And if you see her, she doesn't look like 95. Um, she can see pretty good. Um, she has a little hearing, part, but she can hear. You shake her hand, she will shake her hand off your body. She's super strong. 95 years old. And we went to see her today. It was her birthday. Um, Miracle painted a beautiful painting for her. Um, we sang with her. And it, it was fun. We were singing for her, happy birthday to you. And she was singing, happy birthday to me. It, it was fun. It was fun. We took some <laughs> photographs with her. And she doesn't, she doesn't live by herself, live with her daughter, right? Her elder daughter. But the daughter works. She's a caretaker. But she she, she, had, she just lost her sister, right? Mm -hmm. her, her younger sister who died at 92, right? So we went to comfort her on Friday nights with our kids. We would call some of the elderly and have the kids to pray for them. And they love it because probably nobody else is doing it for them. Right. So we're trying to bring uh, relief from anxiety and depression. All right. So love. Well, as I said, can can yes. I ask you a question? Yes. So, OK, um, like me, I'm single and it's for a, a while. But, Doc, I don't let like say Christmas and whatever I will um last over oh I alone and this way. this thing doesn't bother me I don't know maybe some of them say maybe I'm not human or I don't have feelings <laughs> but no serious dog it, no. it, it don't bother me. <laughs> well everybody everybody's different right Mary and you're not old you're young right you're yes, I'm young, but that's why you know it, it, it doesn't have no effect on me. Sometimes I say maybe I'm not human. I don't know <laughs> because I don't I don't make it bother me, Doc. Maybe maybe it's because or maybe because I was raised like a tongue boy. Maybe all because of that. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Right? I mean, some people some people are better at um, putting things behind them or in the subconscious mind, yeah, but putting cry. it away. Right? But I will all, cry. Right? You but, see. I don't saying. make it bad. Like people will say, oh, you see, no, when I cry, that's it, I done. <laughs> well, you know, that's good because uh, crying is a way of getting rid of negative emotions. Right? Yes. So, so that, that's one way. But, but everybody, everybody's made differently, especially as they get older, you feel lonely, you feel nobody cares about you. You, you kind of regress to being a child, right? And you need care and, and, and extra love as when you were, were a baby. Doc, you uh, know what I say? As mm -hmm. long as God care about me, I don't care who don't care about me. <laughs> well, that's certainly <laughs> one way to look at it, right? But God calls us to care, right? And so even the people might like us, okay, but we still love them. We still love them because we, God said, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God, right? So even though they might love us, we want to love them because we don't want resentment to reside in our hearts, right? So we want to always love people. And we have seen how healthy it is for our bodies and for our minds, right? And First John 4.18 says, perfect love casts out fear, right? So some people say God is a, is a fear, vengeful God. Is fear. That means they don't have perfect love for him, Right? Because the fear we need to have for God is reverence and respect, right? Not, not the fear emotion. So it says a perfect love casts out fear. So if you find yourself being fearful about the storms, fearful of things you see in the news, ask God to give you that perfect love that you need to have in your heart. And then also in uh, Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7, it says, um, be careful or anxious for nothing. But with by prayer 
and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And verse 7 says, And the peace of God that passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and mind through Christ Jesus. Right? Uh, first, uh, sorry, 2 Timothy 1.7 says, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. So if we really love God, it will cast out the fear because fear, the Bible says, bring it torment. And that comes from the other guy, not from God, not from God. All right. So, uh, so we're reminded uh, how love offers a safe space where negative emotions are alleviated. And last week, uh, two weeks ago, we talked about the ants, right? The, the automatic negative thoughts that we normally get. And when those thoughts come, don't ignore them, acknowledge them, write them down, examine them to see if what they're saying is true. If it's not true, cast it away and move forward. But don't let the negative thoughts uh, control you. Okay, how love improves our physical health? We talked about before, uh, about blood pressure, right? So acts of love, whether it's giving or receiving, and some of us uh, are very good givers, but we are not good receivers, right? We want to get the blessing. So we want to give, give, give. But when we don't receive, we block somebody else's blessing, all right? So acts of love, whether it's giving or receiving, lower, will lower your blood pressure and reduce the risk of cardiovascular problems, right? So if you go, if you go to church and it's your birthday, give God a thank offering, yeah? Or you know an elderly person, you know, they're living on a certain income, you know, take some food for them, some fruits for them, you know, uh, find out if there's a bill you can pay for them. This helps to lower your blood pressure. So if you suffer with hypertension, you may want to follow this advice and come next Thursday, God, and tell us how it went down. I promise you, right? Acts of love, whether it's giving or receiving, will lower your blood pressure and reduce the risk of cardiovascular problems. Uh, physically, it will boost your immunity. Loving relationships have been shown to improve immune function, making you less susceptible to illness. What about pain relief? Pain relief, oh yeah. Studies show that love can reduce the perception of pain, whether it's physical or emotional, due to the brain's release of natural painkillers like endorphins. So I remember on one occasion, my wife uh, went to have a tooth extracted and I was in the room with her and I was holding her hand throughout the ordeal. And when the dentist was done, she was surprised he was already done, right? Because of holding my hand uh, and feeling that sense of love and comfort, the endorphins began to kick in like painkillers, all right, along with the oxytocin. All right, so it, it really works. It really works. Emotional resilience through love, right? Some of us, uh, because of grief um, of, of some sort that we have experienced, our hearts are broken and it needs to be knitted up again. It needs to heal from our grief, right? So love helps us to recover from loss by providing comfort and support during difficult times. Uh, relationships grounded in love create safe spaces where emotional wounds can be addressed and healed. Mm -hmm. And we, we said before, you can also build resilience. Love fosters emotional strength, making it easier to navigate life's challenges with a sense of security and support. And there is power in loving yourself. It's not a sin to love yourself. As, as Lynn rightly said before, if you don't love yourself, you really can't love others. Right? So practicing self-love involves treating yourself with kindness. And this is linked to lower stress and better emotional health. And remember, I think some weeks ago, we talked about going to the mirror and talking to the mirror, talking to yourself and telling yourself what are the gifts that God has given you? What are you good at? All right. 
self-acceptance, embracing who you are without harsh judgment. So if you look in the mirror and the figure that you see in the mirror is not the one you had 20 years ago, don't start to beat up upon yourself. Okay, face reality. Okay, you know what? I've put on some pounds in places that I don't really want. That's, that's the challenge. What's the solution? And begin to work on the solution. Like yourself the way you are right now with the mind that you'll like yourself even better as you improve, right? So embrace who you are without harsh judgment. And this will foster a positive self-image, which is key to mental and physical wellness. And of course, the Bible commands us in Mark uh, chapter 12 and verse 31. It says, uh, and the second is like this, talking about commandments, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So, so there's a twofold command there, to love your neighbor and to love yourself. Yeah, are you, are you with me? Love, yeah. love thy neighbor as yourself. So don't love your neighbor more than you love yourself or don't love yourself more than you love your neighbor. So there's none other commandment greater than these. So how loving others heals us, right? H have you ever gone to the hospital to see somebody and you know probably you didn't want to go, you went after work, you're tired, you had a hard day, the, the boss yelled at you, you were in traffic when you're going to see the person, but and then you got there, you began to talk with them, to pray with them, you sang with them, and when you left, you can't believe you're the same person. Instead of taking the elevator, you take the stairs. You feel pumped up, right? That's because love for others can heal us, right? So through kindness and empathy, acts of love toward others generate positive feelings in both the giver and the receiver. And this reinforces a sense of purpose and joy. You know, Pastor Rayborn, uh -huh. uh, for five years, I was uh, the leader for our seniors. Mm -hmm. And um, we did all kinds of things. We, we Once a month or twice a month, we would take them to like the farmer's market, would take them to the mountains where they could pick apples and uh, a certain time of the season we would take them to pick uh, strawberries and mm -hmm. peaches and different things like that. And around the holidays, we would uh, just take them out just so they could just see the decorations and, and all of that. And at mm -hmm. the end of each one of our trips, we would take them out to dinner. Do you mm -hmm. know it, it, it just made a world of difference because a lot of them were living by themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Or if they had family members, they were not engaging them mm -hmm. in activities to keep them youthful and cheerful. And when we had our meetings, they would attend those meetings. Mm -hmm. It was never a failure in terms of uh, an adequate presence. And on top of all of that, I ended up they ended up buying sweatshirts so like every time we would go out, we would all dress alike. <laughs> I mean, it was it was great. And on top of that, they would call me. When when are we going? Are we going wow. someplace soon? <laughs> it was it was I enjoyed it. I missed that group. Wow. But since such time, though, we've lost a few of them. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm sure they're I, I, I see the difference of sharing what love really means and how it affects a person. Yeah. Positively. Yeah. yeah. It affects both people. Yes. Right. Um, so. Part of loving is serving others. Serving others yes. through love leads to personal growth. Did you know that? You yes. can personally grow by loving others, right? Because it teaches patience. It teaches humility and fulfillment. You might not like everybody, but God calls us to love everybody, right? There's a difference, right? Calls us to love. The love is a principle, right? Liking is a choice. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, love and fulfillment. Love brings meaning to life, creating a sense of connection and belonging that is vital for mental and emotional health. So here are some simple tips for, for love, for healing, right? Love for healing. Active listening. Now, active listening means that you're not on your cell phone 
where somebody's talking to you, you're not texting somebody else, you're not on watching the, the news or some show on television, you're not looking out the window, you're not cutting the person off when they're talking. Active listening is just that, actively listening. Uh, James chapter 1 and verse 19 tells us, Therefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Mm -hmm. Right? The first one is listening. Be swift to hear. So being present and truly listening to someone is a powerful act of love mm -hmm. that promotes understanding and connection. People want to know that they're being heard. Mm -hmm. And you, you can say, well, you know, you're watching the news or whatever, and the person is talking, and the person is looking at you and say, but you're not listening. And he said, yes, but you're lying. You are hearing what the person is saying because listening involves both the eyes and the ears. Hearing involves just the ear. But actively mm -hmm. listening means that nothing else is taking up your attention mm -hmm. but the person talking to you. Forgiveness. Wow, this is a huge one, huge one, right? Letting go of grudges is an act of love. And I, let me confess, I have, I have an ongoing challenge. You know, I'm ready to forgive people, but there are some people I don't want to forgive. Because I think what they did is so ridiculous. They, they, they know that they're wrong. And then it's worse when they don't want to admit or ask for forgiveness. And yeah. so I ask God, Lord, this is my challenge because I'm a, I tend to, to, to be a loving person. And so when you have hurt me, especially I think you did it on purpose, it's a challenge. Yeah. You know, I, I said, Lord, please give me the desire to I want to forgive. Mine. Yeah, yeah. To give me a heart of love. Remove resentment. Because it will only hurt me in the long run. Right? Letting go of grudges is an act of love that promotes healing for you and peace in relationships, right? I remember I heard a story of Helen Keller. Mm -hmm. And she had a big problem with, with forgiving people, really big. Some she could, she could others she couldn't. And there's one person, the person had died, and she still couldn't forgive them. And she went to this Methodist minister and was talking to him and asking him for guidance. And while they were talking the person who normally rings the huge bell outside is ringing the bell. And the minister stops and looks outside. He, he says, Helen, you know, that bell you're hearing, there is somebody who's pulling the rope that is causing the bell to rock back and forth and, and for the, um, the, 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 the iron piece in the center to hit on it. Ding, dong, ding, dong. And he said, you know, that's how you could forgive somebody. If you keep ringing the bell, ding, dong, that's like the memory of what the person has done. You keep bringing up the issue over and over, what the person did, what the person did. It's just keeping it alive, right? You, you must come to a point where you, some people say, I could forgive, but I can't forget. Now, that can go both ways. If you have come to a point where you have forgiven the person, when you see them, you could remember what they have done, but you don't hold any resentment against them, that's okay. But if when you see the person and you remember the event, you are reliving the negative event, you're getting angry again, that's not good. So you said but, ringing the bell, listening to the ding-dong, reminds you or keeps you abreast of what the person has done to you. Yeah, yeah. you keep re reliving it over and over. Ding, dong, ding. Dong. And then eventually, you know, the, the bell will stop swinging, right? And the music will stop until you pull the rope again. So pulling the rope is equivalent to bringing up the, the bad memories again and rehearsing it. So, Doc, you could forgive them, but you don't have to have them in your life, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a choice that you have to make, Mary. You have to make well, that love, I mean, love them at a distance. <laughs> uh, is is that a such a thing? Yeah. Yes, it is. <laughs> you know, when, when the Bible tells you to shake the dust off your feet and keep it moving, they don't want it. <coughs> is yeah, that, that's is a, that applicable. 
Pastor? That's a choice that you have to make with you and God. But right? but is um, that applicable? That that what I quoted was comes from the Bible. Yeah, but that is not about um forgiveness. That if you go, the disciples went to a city to preach the gospel and it didn't accept them, Christ saying, Don't bother to waste time and stay there. Go to the city, dust off the dust from your shoe. And in other words, they are left up to themselves to face their judgment. You have done your part. But the forgiveness part, it's it's very hard when somebody has hurt you especially emotionally, um, to see them every day and to be able to forgive them. You have to find space between you and that person to allow your, your, you to heal. If you're constantly in their presence, that could be a problem. Right. Or it, it will take longer for you to heal. But because remember, when you don't forgive, there are certain organs of your body that are being affected. Yeah. So, so this is not just for the person, but it's for you. Right. Physically and spiritually. And then the Bible says, if you don't forgive men their trespass, trespasses, neither can God forgive you. Yes, Doc. I know all that, but Doc, uh, to <laughs> me, if I forgive you, uh -huh. you, I have to stay, you in one town, I in another town. So the less <laughs> I see you, the better for me. We don't really across <laughs> nobody. Because Doc, I'll be honest with you. I was hurt real bad by my own flesh and blood. Mm -hmm. Where that suicide came into my mind to just jump in front of a train because I had nowhere mm -hmm. and nobody to turn to. Mm. Doc, and I forgive my sister. Mm -hmm. But I love her at a distance. If she dies, she's sick, she's in the hospital, Doc, I will go to see her and talk Amen. to her and think. Amen. But to say to go at her home and hand her wrong as if you know, is lovey-dovey? No, I, I cannot play that part, Doc. <laughs> I'm sorry. If God have to punish me, well, I'm willing to take that punishment, but I'm not doing that. <laughs> well, that experience is really a concern because that's where yeah. I am now with my family. Uh, I don't hate them. If 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 somebody call me with a crisis, I will be there. Matter of mm -hmm. fact, one person has already called me and asked me twice for some money, and I gave it to them, but have no relationship with them at all. And I and I do think about the fact that anytime you call me, I know you want something, but you're not trying to establish a relationship with me. But that person, that sister, was in a crisis, and the one that's dealing with me with the legal stuff, we're mm -hmm. almost to the end. One of my major prayers was, Lord, do not let me hate. Correct. And I can honestly say today, there is no hatred there. Amen. You know, Doc, I don't, I, I don't hate my sister because we are same mother, but not same father. I don't hate her. Mm -hmm. But Doc, when your own, I mean, forefather, you could say, you know what? You're not my father, child, whatever. But your, your mother, you can, a woman cannot mm -hmm. deny her child. She just cannot do that. And for you to treat me that way, Doc, and then you saying you don't care because you didn't raise with me? Mm -hmm. Come on. Well, you know, Mary, that's where your Christianity has to come up because by the words that you say that she you, that tells you something, right? Mm -hmm. she, she's hurting on the inside. You know, a lot of times in these situations where same mother, different father, you have this, um, unconscious war that probably your mother took my my father um, your mother took away um... no 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 doc no the the problem is doc you cannot she want to blame you whatever my mother did you cannot mm -hmm. pass it down to me I, I, I understand. wasn't there. I understand. You understand? I wasn't there. I understand. What, my mother was raped at 14 years by your father. My mm. mother did what she thought was the best thing for you. Mm -hmm. She gave you, she didn't kill you, she didn't have, she gave you to your father's people to go and look mm -hmm. for a job. When she went back for you, they didn't give it to her body at a 14-year-old. What you want a 14-year-old to do with a child, a child herself? How can mm -hmm. a child raise a child? Mm. And you are an adult right now. You have a better life than all of us, right? God bless you. You have a good life. As I tell her, look at that as a blessing. Mm -hmm. You should be happy. Mommy gave you to your family. Now you have some, you achieve something in life. Mm -hmm. Holding it as a grudge and passing it down on all of us. 
Well, in your case, what since you know all of this, Mary, you um, want to feel sorry for her. You want to empathize with her, not to um, allow her to, to do stuff to hurt other people, but you can understand where she's coming from. And if she's not a, if she's not, hold on, Mary. I'm... Hold on, Mary. If she's not a Christian, mm -hmm. if she's not a Christian, she's holding on to all of this resentment. She's not giving it to God. It mm -hmm. will make her bitter. Hurt yes. people hurt people. Uh, that's right. But right. Doc, we, we spoke about it already. I talk to I tell her, you know what? Just leave it. Just you know, mm -hmm. tell mommy sorry. She didn't do it intentionally because mm -hmm. mommy had no choice as a child. Mm -hmm. You know, just forget about that. Just just watch it as water under the bridge and you know right. Right. move on and thing. But doc, if she don't want to do it, and then you already hurt me. So what I standing by again for you to do the same thing? No, I I hear I, I hear you, and that's what I said. It's your choice. You got to pray about it. The and... girl almost tried to make my child turn against me, you know, my mm. own children. So, yeah. no, I'd rather yeah, stay yeah, at yeah. a distance. Rather be yeah, at a yeah. distance. Yeah. yeah. You, whatever God tells you. Whatever God tells you. But just, and like you said, if she's sick, um, you're willing to do whatever it is to help, that's good. That means you have good intention, right? So if staying away at a distance for now will help you to heal better, then that's what you have to do. Right. All right. So uh, Bernard Melzer said this, when you forgive, you in no way change the past, but you sure do change the future. W what does that mean to you, anybody? When you forgive, you in no way change the past, but you sure do change the future. Well, in the past, what has happened is what has happened. You can't change that. But the future says when you when you forgive, now I have a contentment of heart. I have a clean conscience. I have done all that God has required me to do, and we I would move forward. That's the future. Okay. Because one experience builds upon another experience. If you're successful with this one and doing it and resolving it according to biblical principles. Then the next experience comes, it would not be so difficult because you have seen how God has worked for you in the in the past. Did, and did it there... teaches you, it teaches you how to handle circumstances that come your way. Mm -hmm. There are certain family members of mine who have really hurt me. I mean, really hurt me. And I never thought I would be able to remember what they did and not be angry with them. And I can tell you by the grace of God that right now I could think of one, you know, and I have no resentment in my heart. I've forgiven them. I felt sorry that God has taken away the pain. And most of them, I don't even remember the issue, even when I talk to the individual. And that's the point where we have to come to by God's strength, by God's grace, before it is too late or we'll never enter heaven. How, how long did it take you? Um, For a few years? Yeah, it took me about five, what, five years. It, it was really tough. It was really tough. Okay, and so now the two guys are getting along, and when you speak to that person, uh, that experience doesn't come up? No, I, I remember it, and I'm not mad. Okay. Yeah, and I know it's not me. Right. It, it's a miracle. Yes. It's, it's all God. Right. Because I give it to him, and I gave him permission to, to help me to forgive that person. Because it will help me in the long run. Uh huh. All right. So, simple tips for love, for healing, appreciation, <laughs> expressing gratitude, and acknowledging others' efforts fosters love and connection. All right. So, if somebody does something good for you, show appreciation. Show appreciation. Right. Show gratitude. Acknowledge their efforts. Somebody might bring you, give you a gift for your birthday. Uh, you may have two more of the same thing in the house. Show gratitude. The person didn't know that, but the person thought about you. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, love impact beyond yourself, family and community. Loving actions create positive environments leading to healthier families and communities. Even in the wider society, the act of loving others transcends personal health and improves social or societal well-being by fostering empathy, kindness, and cooperation. 
So we have to live a life of love every day, every day, every day on the calendar by God's grace, right? Um, we got to integrate love in all that we do, making love a daily practice through kindness, empathy, and forgiveness improves our overall health and well-being. In the book of James, it says, if you are sick, the Christian, call the elders to pray for you. But it also says you have to forgive those who have done wrong against you before God can hear that prayer of healing. All right? And their long-term benefits, a lifestyle grounded in love, promotes emotional balance, physical health, spiritual fulfillment, creating a harmonious and healthier life. So to conclude, let's recap uh, love as the ultimate medicine. Love heals mentally, physically, emotionally, and spiritually, offering a holistic approach to health. And here's the call to action. We have to actively practice love in our lives, both for ourselves and for others as a path to healing and growth. And a lot of times, most people who behave as we have discussed, they have been hurt. Uh -huh. and, and they don't know God the way we know God. And so we cannot just retaliate or behave like them. I, I saw a, um, a quotation the other day, and I've been trying it in my life. It says, don't treat others the way they have treated you. Right. Treat them the way Jesus treats you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Don't treat others the way they have treated you. Treat them the way Jesus treats you, right? And I'm not saying it's going to be easy, but Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So if we want to do it, if we have the desire, the intentionality to do it, God will give us the strength to do it. All right, so I invite questions briefly, um, if you have any, or any short discussion we can have. If not, we can pray and we can close. And let me take up, take up the recording so we can talk freely. Okay, I have Sounds a... like... Go ahead. Um, um, 